In ancient Greek mythology, there is a story called Phaethon and the Sun. It follows Phaethon, the young son of Helios, the sun god who every day would ride his chariot across the sky, bringing heat and energy to Earth. Phaethon, desperate for proof of his father's divinity, visits his temple. After confirming their relations, Helios decides to grant his son any favor he'd like. Rashfully, Phaethon requests to personally drive his father's chariot across the sky. Helios tries to persuade him otherwise, but, bound by his promise, is forced to hand it over to the unrelenting Phaethon. Immediately after launching, Phaethon loses control of the chariot, and skewing off course, it recklessly streaks across the sky, getting too close to the ground and scorching the Earth's surface. At this point, the Greeks claim that Libya's hills were bleached into desert, the Nile retreated, and the Ethiopian people's skin darkened. While this story is purely myth, it subtly hints at a more significant fact. The deserts of Libya and other Saharan nations were not always the barren wastelands that they are today. Earth is an incredibly dynamic planet, more than many of us may think. Not only are its tectonic plates, weather, and seasons constantly changing, its orientation in space is far from constant. Due to the Earth's slightly oblate shape and the gravitational pull of other planets in our solar system, Earth's orbit, tilt, and wobble are continually fluctuating over time. Every 100,000 years, the Earth's orbit cycles between a nearly circular and a slightly elliptical shape. Every 41,000 years, the tilt of Earth's axis fluctuates between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees. And every 26,000 years, Earth's axis wobbles around one complete cycle. These three fluctuations are referred to as the Milankovitch cycles, after Serbian mathematician Milutin Milankovic, who pioneered the study of them in the early 20th century. He discovered that, by affecting the amount and location of sunlight hitting Earth, these cycles have a serious impact on the long-term climate of Earth. For example, the more eccentric Earth's orbit is, the greater the difference in season lengths, and the greater Earth's tilt is, the more extreme the seasons are. However, maybe the most interesting result comes from the relationship between Earth's wobble and its orbit. Nowadays, Earth reaches its perihelion, or the point when it's closest to the Sun, in early January. As a result, the Earth gets a little extra sunlight during Northern Hemisphere winter and Southern Hemisphere summer. However, around 13,000 years ago, when the Earth's wobble was on the other end of its cycle, this situation was reversed. The Earth got a little extra sunlight during Northern Hemisphere summer and Southern Hemisphere winter. As a result, summer radiation over North Africa was 7% higher than it is today. While this difference may seem small, it had an immense impact on the region's climate. With more energy hitting the surface, air got hotter and rose higher, creating a low-pressure zone and in turn a convection that drew moist air in from the surrounding Atlantic. This moist air then rose and cooled down, condensing into rain clouds that showered over the Sahara. Climate models have revealed that this process increased North African rainfall by between 17 and 50 percent compared to today. This increased rainfall allowed for more vegetation growth along the coasts and southern edges of the Sahara. And vegetation, which is darker than sand and therefore absorbs more energy, plus helps transfer underground moisture into the atmosphere through transpiration, in turn generated more rainfall. More rainfall allowed for more plant life, creating a positive feedback loop that ultimately spread vegetation across North Africa. Meanwhile, this extra rainfall began accumulating in the region's geographic depressions to form lakes. Some of these were enormous, including Lakes Megafezan and Anet in modern-day Libya and Algeria, and Lake Megachad, which once covered 360,000 square kilometers, making it the largest freshwater lake in the world at the time, and slightly smaller than the Caspian Sea today. These lakes, along with now non-existent river networks, trapped water in the Sahara's interior, allowing for vegetation to be sustained year-round. As a result, nearly the entire Sahara Desert was turned into a lush green region, all just 10,000 years ago. And while this may seem hard to believe, there are loads of evidence to support it. All across the Sahara, in places where there is now nothing but sand and rock, art from ancient peoples reveal highly detailed scenes of gazelles, elephants, rhinos, hippos, giraffes, and other animals. In the Tenere Desert in Niger, which is now completely inhospitable to life, archaeologists have found hundreds of human graves and the remains of land animals, large fish, and crocodiles. 
In Libya and Algeria, ancient riverbeds have been discovered with evidence of human occupation. And in Chad, evidence of Lake Megachad's ancient shores are shown through sand spits and beach ridges. Maybe the most direct evidence, though, comes from sampled cores of underwater sediment off the coast of Africa, which are used to study Saharan dust flux, the amount of sand blown off the African continent and into the ocean. These cores reveal that between 10 and 5,000 years ago, the amount of sand blowing off Africa was much lower than today, which can be linked to more moisture and plant life. In addition, the pollen trapped in these cores reveals increases in plants like grasses and sedges during this time period. Because of all this evidence, scientists have deduced that between 12 and 5,000 years ago, the Sahara was a completely different region than today, covered in grasslands, waterways, and forests, and filled with animals and ancient human settlements. However, starting around 6,000 years ago, this green world quickly receded away. With the orbital cycles reversing, the same feedback loop that made the Sahara green quickly transformed it into the wasteland we know today. In addition, human practices, including cattle overgrazing and fireland management techniques, may have further strained the region's ecology. Within just a few centuries, the lakes dried up, plant life retreated south, and the animals and people followed suit. Despite the Sahara's current state, it is almost guaranteed that there will be another humid period in the future. In fact, over the past several million years, there's evidence for over 230 of these green periods, lining up with the fluctuation of Earth's wobble. As a result, when the Earth's wobble reverses again in about 13,000 years, researchers expect the Sahara to turn green. If human society is still alive and thriving by then, this development will have a profound effect on global geopolitics. The barren deserts of Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Mauritania, Mali, Niger, Chad, and Sudan will become fertile, opening up new areas for settlement and likely leading to immense population growth. Rivers will flow and lakes will refill. North Africa will become a new global hotspot, with new cities and potentially new countries sprouting up. However, this is quite far into the future, and there is no guarantee that human civilization will still be alive and prospering. To overcome this time hindrance, researchers have theorized ways to artificially green the Sahara, potentially even within the next few centuries. The first is actually already happening. Unlike the gradual fluctuations in Earth's climate caused by the Milankovitch cycles, Earth's climate is currently undergoing a rapid transformation due to human-induced greenhouse gas emissions. These emissions are trapping more energy in the Earth's atmosphere and on its surface. Models reveal that this increased energy could trigger the same processes that brought more rainfall to North Africa 10,000 years ago, expanding vegetation across the region. And while this is admittedly exciting, heating up the entire Earth for more plants in the Sahara is probably not the best idea. There are other, less harmful ways to achieve the same goal, and maybe the most promising would actually help fight climate change in the process. Models show that by installing large-scale solar and wind farms in the Sahara, which increase surface roughness and make the terrain darker, more energy would be absorbed and precipitation would rise. In the near future, we could take advantage of this, simultaneously harvesting renewable energy while triggering the positive feedback loop and bringing back the green Sahara. If you enjoyed this video, it would be amazing if you like and subscribe to Futurology for more videos very similar to this one. Thanks for watching and see you next time.